Welcome to Behavioral Health in the New Normal, a podcast developed by Prestige Community Resources, aimed at bringing healing back to our community through knowledge, expert advice, and positive messaging. The show is a joint venture between the Department of Behavioral Health and Prestige Community Resources, funded by SAMHSA in response to the challenges currently impacting our communities. Hosted by Paul Wells Sr., who uses over 30 years of extensive clinical social work experience to conduct insightful interviews with experts and professionals on a wide range of topics that impact the Washington, D.C. community. From behavioral health crisis to education to financial hardship and anything in between, this show will provide information and insights that will surely make a difference in your life. Welcome back, family. Oh boy, do we have a show for you today. I am honored and excited about our guest who's going to share uh, her experiences working with veterans. And there's going to be a special focus on uh, women who are veterans of uh, service. Uh, but today, without further ado, I want to introduce Ms. Sharon Green to the show. Ms. Green, welcome. So glad to have you. Well, thank you for having me. The honor. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I want to remind the audience that today's podcast is uh, sponsored by a collaboration. It's a collaboration between Prestige Community Resources, the Department of Behavioral Health here in Washington, D.C., and SAMHSA. Uh, now, Ms. Green is going to talk to us again uh, a lot about the veterans, uh, her work with veterans. Uh, she's a native New Yorker and a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel. She's a business owner and author with more than 30 years of leadership and financial management experience. Ms. Green is the founding chief executive officer of Atlas Consulting Group, LLC. Uh, I don't, not sure if I pronounced that right. Could you help me out? Is it Atlas? Did I say that right? It's Alathase. Alathase is the good word for speaking the truth. Yes. Get that. Alathase. Okay. And you also understand, Ms. Green, you provide leadership, coaching, you do speaking engagements and training for corporate executives, nonprofit organizations, veterans, and individuals globally. So, Ms. Green, without further ado, we'd like you to actually kind of introduce yourself. And why don't we start with your early life. Where were you born? Where were you <laughs> raised? What school did you go to? I see you're a native New Yorker, so I'm, very, I'm from New York too, so I want to hear a little bit more about that. And then if you could take us to how did you get into the military service? So tell us about you. Sure, and thanks again. Well, I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, and so, you know, growing up- Oh, no, stop. No, 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 <laughs> stop. I'm from Buffalo, New York. You're kidding me. No way. You're from Buffalo, New York? Are you a Bills fan? What? Yes, you are. are you a Bills fan? I turn this camera <laughs> on and you'll see it. I'm, I'm doing that, Buffalo. Right. Absolutely. I grew up on the yes, east side yes. and then we moved to the north side. Are you serious? What? Okay, I'm sorry. Exactly, I'm excited yes. now. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I grew up um, near Berg, Burger at High School. That's the, my my area off of Fillmore. But I went to City Honors, yeah. and then I left um, okay. Buffalo and went to Howard University, HU, right here in D.C. Because one of okay. actually I I came to Howard on a basketball scholarship. I wanted to go to um, Howard. I had scholarships all in Pennsylvania and Ohio, but I sent my stuff to Howard and like, I want to go there. And I got the scholarship, yeah. came here. A good friend of mine went into the army back then. Okay. And so I said, well, let me check out ROTC because mm -hmm. I had an ROTC scholarship too. But I'm like, I don't know if I want to be in the military for 20 years. So at then, you know, being young, I was 17 when I left home, I turned it down. So I went, um, mm -hmm. I came here and then I did our OTC. It's like, I love telling people what to do. I might as well get paid to do it. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> that was my involvement as far as joining them um, and wanting to be in the military. Okay. And then after that, I left and started a great career as a financial manager. So okay. I forgot you. you I want to talk more about that transition, but let, let's go back to Buffalo, New York. <laughs> and, and that transition from Buffalo to Washington, D.C., uh, there's some adjustments that obviously have to be made mentally when you leave Buffalo and come to, to the DMV area, right? Uh, yes. What was your, 
What was that like leaving Buffalo and coming to D.C. for the first time? Do you remember the experience? Oh, I do. I remember it. I remember it so much. The guy When I rolled around D.C. and out, you know, in Maryland, and I'm like, all I could think is, look at all the Black people. Yeah, <laughs> all absolutely. I could think about is, like, you know, all the Black people everywhere, you know, and our suburbs is mm-hmm. a totally different environment. And then to come here and continue to drive out and see so many. And I'll be honest, my um, when I went to Howard, I had no idea about apartheid apartheid Mm, um, they were fighting against apartheid and having um different rallies and stuff on the yard you know i learned a lot because you know we think we know everything coming out of one environment and if you never leave that environment i'm an advocate now about leave your environment you know raise your children up in a way they should go they should go bless them. Really Don't curse old. them. <laughs> Absolutely. So that they're That's not held right. hostage like to your decision. They like we never I never What's chose that? Buffalo, New York. My parents did. And so for me to just That's stay right. there and live there, why? There's <laughs> so many other places to go That's and right. see and be That's a right. part of. Yeah. But yes, that, that was the main like thing I left. definitely <laughs> Yeah. I like you. I left Buffalo at, at age 18, never to return. Um, and it's it's you know. Uh, my life here in the DMV has worked out for me very well. And as a mental health practitioner, this is this area is just ripe with opportunity, especially for an African-American therapist. And so, so I still go home from time, I still have family there, and I still have memory. Um, but home now is the DMV. So you left, you go to Howard uh, on a scholarship. Did you, you play basketball at Howard? I did. I played basketball, basketball and then I got kicked oh. off the team. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yes, oh, oh. what happened? Basketball. I'm not, not sure if you can share that part, but what happened? I'll just say, you know, can words. You words are very powerful. <laughs> my words, my okay. words to someone else. Being young, you don't think, well, you know, I got a scholarship. We had walk-ons to come onto the team because over half our team got kicked off because of grades. Well, grades have never been my mm-hmm. problem. So when we had the new people okay. coming in, I'm not thinking, you know, they might be going for scholarships or whatever, but just having a conversation with one of my teammates got, um, um, tra- it was transitioned to the assistant coach, to the coach. Next thing I got suspended. Now I'm 17, you're supposed to be mentoring me. But back then, <laughs> okay kicked yeah. off and my attitude was like so what you know i had our otc scholarship where i got here i get another one <laughs> and i did you That's know right. my, my words of faith okay. did manifest for me but i still play basketball matter of fact i played basketball for over 30 years even after getting kicked off the team i haven't played for, for the germans played in the military it was still mm. a great passion it became a better pr- passion once i got kicked off <laughs> like how you gonna kick yeah. me off <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. all good it worked out well yeah, it sounds like it did. And when I look at your bio and just your successful career in life, uh, obviously it all worked out for your good. And so you you you, you know do the ROTC into the military as a African American woman. What was that uh, transition point like for you? So that was a little different. Um... I was really kind of cocky when I was younger about, you know, the things I could do. I Mm. I learned to be humble. I always love helping people. So going into the military as coming out of Howard, you're kind of trained that you're going to face different diversity issues. You're going to face issues as being a woman. So we were pressed hard. We ran longer. We trained longer, you know, just because of the experience of our cadre. So going in, I always had this attitude about, you know, there's nothing I can't learn. And so being in a, even the finance corps, it was smaller, but I noticed early on Mm -hmm. that me and another lieutenant, we both were working at a a higher headquarters. She didn't know nothing about her job, (laughs) nothing about her job, but she had a good NCO working with her who was African-American. And so he helped her out. I had a different route. You know, I had to work harder, make sure everything, all my T's was crossed, I's was dotted, and basically stand up for myself. If I didn't know how to stand up for myself and actually produce excellence, I probably Mm would have never made it to retirement. And many did not back then because the 
when I first went in in 1988, the majority of officers were white males. And so they expected yeah. you to golf and to play racquetball and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. And I didn't have a problem speaking up for myself. And what I found is most people with the title of officer, they're a bunch of punks. <laughs> so if you look them in yeah. the face, they'll never mm -hmm. say, I want you to fail. You get on my nerves. They'll never do that. So you ask them, like, especially when it comes to ratings, um, I did this. Can you reword this to say that? Can we? Can you give me credit for this? They're not going to tell you no. And, right. I, and then plus you, you don't have right. to bow down to their ignorance. And I did learn that early on. <laughs> I had to get locked in a, in a vault <laughs> to learn not mm. to fight. Learn, but I had to learn how to fight. And so luckily I had people around me to teach me how to do that because I was ready to fight everything. This is wrong. Okay, you know, you're treating people different. Where did, <laughs> yeah. Where did your strong voice and your tenacity come from? It sounds like, I don't know if it came from the Buffalo experience, but what you're telling me is you just, uh, you were already equipped with boldness. And so where did that personality style come from? Can you, can you identify that? Have you identified? I don't know, probably uh, my mom was an educator. And, and so she always would teach me and my sister that, you know, there's nothing we can't do. Basically, there's nothing you can't. So I believed her. I, you know, there's nothing that I, that I can do. I just, like I said, I had to learn tact yeah. as a young person that's in charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely had to learn tech. Now the, my, my company is called Alaface. I mean, speaking the truth and love, you know, and because mm -hmm. I don't have a problem speaking the truth. It's just how. So now it's to build up and not to tear down. It's to equip and so that people will be able to help themselves. Okay. And so that's, I think, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's where it came from. And then later on in life, then, you know, just the Lord, loving the Lord, knowing you're with me, you love me, you protecting me. And long as I'm obedient, I expect good results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just truly do. Well, so your the, the spiritual foundation and your faith, uh, that is the direct result of what? Mm -hmm. So my faith and the practice of faith was keenly developed. It I will say it even goes back to my military, because military teach you obedience. There are consequences and repercussions mm -hmm. when you don't follow instructions. And so growing up, even going to church, every even as a young person, you go to church you kind of like out of obligation. As I got older, it was like, okay, what does this mean? What does that mean? How am I supposed to do that? You know, so as, and when I put the obedience to mm -hmm. actually understanding what I'm reading, to okay, we're not doing this. Why this doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense. And when I, you start to really know that if Holy Spirit is my teacher, I need to be taught by the source. <laughs> so that gives you the confidence That's to know right. that God is good. It can't be bad and good. It can't be broke and wealthy. It can't no. be sick and whole. That's so right. you have to get out the middle. I learned how to get out of the middle and just be confident and trust. Trust in that which I can't see, you know, hear, taste, or smell. Yeah. Ms. Green, can you share with us how you matriculated through the ranks and and uh, describe some of your upward mobility within the, the military? Okay, so, you know, you come in as a second lieutenant, and for me, I came in in charge. So I came in, I was at Fort Eustis, Virginia, and I was supposed to be the cash control officer working with a dispersing officer. But my dispersing officer transitioned or was most people died before I got there. So I had to um, basically take on her role until they could hire someone else to come in and do the job. And I'll just say, by the time they hired someone to come in and do the job, that was my first counseling. Never put yourself in a position where you can't be replaced. I had, I learned everything. I did everything. I made sure that people were taken care of, payments were being made. Um, the books were uh, correct for accounting. We brought in a, a pay system during that time. I learned the whole pay system. So when they got ready to transition me out of that area to do something else, the civilian that came in behind me, he couldn't keep up with that. He couldn't keep up with doing everything I was doing because we had a backlog. Well, I hated backlogs because we have an opportunity to fix this and start fresh. And But anyway, so I, after that as a lieutenant, then I, um, of course, got promoted to captain. I was in Germany then when that happened. And that's mm -hmm. when I really had a face with, um, I would say, a uh, black and white issue. I was in the organization right. and I was supposed to be up next for being the <laughs> company commander. They brought in another yeah. white, a white female to take this position. And, 
you know, of course I go in, how did this happen? I'm here. These are my soldiers. Why did you bring in somebody else? Well, she has one day date of rank on you because they couldn't say because of work ethics. One day date of rank. I said, we came into the military on the same day at the same time. The only difference was hmm. when I first came in, I did not put the date that I left my house. You, I was actually supposed, I probably could go back and fight this. <laughs> I was actually supposed to come on active duty the day you leave your <laughs> it home. It sounds like you might, you might want to, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I put the date that I arrived at the duty station, which is the day after, which would have given okay. her one day day to rank on me. But needless to say, she pretty much got fired. And I eventually got that and got the position. Um, okay. But just going over the years, I've been able to travel overseas. I think I got promoted at major Absolutely. when I was at Fort Gordon, Georgia. I ran the mm -hmm. finance office at Fort Gordon, Georgia, which was all our okay. signal communication and from I, intelligence people are. And from then mm -hmm. on, throughout this, remember, I played basketball the whole time, too. I played basketball until I got to Texas <laughs> for hood. And okay. by then, I, th I was lieutenant okay. colonel by then. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Had a couple of deployments. This, uh, you, I mean, the way you describe some of your er earlier experiences uh, lends itself. For me to believe that you have a heart for the people clearly you're a leader that's been established through your military experience but you have a heart for the people when i when i consider just the description and philosophy of your agency or your company where did the heart of people come you're caring of people you're wanting to promote and empower people where did that come from oh that definitely came from my mom she always was a servant leader, always volunteering. She was um, nationally in Buffalo, nationally with our sorority, with the other Sigma Theta, with um, the uh, mm. Progressive National Baptist Convention on their board. She did the National Bowling Association <laughs> and just helping people and giving. And that's just naturally, um, I think that's just naturally inherited by me. So even to this day, it's, it's still... Yeah something that I chose to do. Heard through genetics, but also you learned it through social learning. You watched her um, and you, oh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you were the yeah, beneficiary yeah. Of, of monitoring her, her uh, good attitude and her delivery of services to others. Now, listen, we're, we're about a year into this COVID-19 thing and it's been so disruptive on many, many levels. And this podcast has been really committed to describing its impact directly on various peoples, various professional um, entities. Uh, can you describe uh, what it was like for you about a year ago when the country was informed that the pandemic was here? Somewhere around March or April of last year, the news forecasts uh, that the pandemic was here. How did you receive that information and what did you do with that information? So I had just came off of a cruise and um, I'm not really a big oh. news person, but my sister is and she's a, she's a nurse. And so watch the news. So started watching the news and I initially, I didn't believe it because we, you know, being in an environment with so many lies going forth in this country, you know, you never really know if it's the truth or not. So then the accountant side of me started doing the math, looking at the number of cases, the number, well, the number of people that reside in the U.S. compared to the number of cases, compared to the number of people that had transitioned at the time, the percentage was really low. So I really didn't believe it initially, but then I started listening to the experts. Now, that's one thing that I'm as smart as I may think I am. I'm not an expert in everything. So you start listening to the experts and then a trust for what's being said. So I gained a trust for what's being said. But my first thought was, you're shutting down everything. You are putting people out of work. How are they going to take care of their families? That was my first okay. thought. It wasn't that we would have so many people to transition during, the, during um, COVID. Um, it was, you're putting yeah. people in a position that they will not be able to take care of themselves. And, and, and yeah. I hate fear. So fear was at an all time high back then, but mm -hmm. personally, I, I, um, work from home and I, um, 
I love to travel. And even throughout the pandemic, I still ended up traveling because I used to go um, monthly to see my dad and take him to. But other than that, that was my oh, initial okay. thought is just people. <laughs> How are they going to be able to take care of themselves? Well, yeah. No, have a job. And it's just consistent. It's just consistent with how you're conveying your personality and your gifts and your talents. Uh, hearing you transfer to others, vulnerable populations particularly. Vulnerability is what caught your attention. And those, some of us have the wherewithal and the resources to sustain ourselves during a crisis. You're very aware that there's a large group of people who just don't have the capacity and the ability suffer any anything of this magnitude one bad day can realize now about an entire year of disruption um so i appreciate the sensitivity now i know you retired from the army how many years retired has it had as of this date it's been nine how many years have you now been retired i've been nine retired years. nine years oh uh, i'm sure you're still in it's been nine years. Um, I know you're still acquainted with, familiar with, and, and staying in touch with um, some of the trends that veterans you know, undergo. What is your sense of how the pandemic has affected um, the veterans? So veterans are, I have this big this saying, veterans are still people. <laughs> we are not what we do. We've earned that, that right to be a veteran, but it's impacted veterans the same way pretty much as it impacted other people. Um, working with, uh, on the advisory co committee, the advisory council for homeless veterans with the VA, I will say that they, we had, it has actually up-leveled services because now more veterans mm -hmm. that we may not have, um, that may not have come to the, v the VA. And I will say that I do not represent the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm just blessed right. to be on the advisory committee as a special employee. Right. But they have veterans come in, you know, that come in now for the vaccine that may not have been in the system. And they're able to actually identify them and help them. And I'm not, my push now is for the wraparound services. So when they come in, that we don't lose track of them. But when it first started, I mean, our, our committee had a meeting um, because we were supposed to travel. We can't travel out to different places in the U.S. to see how the homeless population is being impacted. But we wanted to push a letter to the secretary about how to reach out to the veterans, because now we have a safety issue with not just the teams to go out and service the veterans, but with the veterans themselves, because they are a very vulnerable population, just living, you know, living out there. So we had to increase how they would get housing, temporary housing, or move them fast to permanent housing. But at the end of the day, because we're used to being teens, you can't just throw a veteran into an apartment and say, yay, you have housing. Because now I've created isolation that could be like a jail cell. And now we have the mental health right. issue now and then the increased rate of suicide. So all of these things elevated. How can we best get a handle on this with our veteran population so that we don't get a more negative consequences out of trying to help? But it definitely has up level services, has given a lot of awareness on both sides, which has been a great thing at this point. Early on, it wasn't there, but now it is it's definitely a good thing. Ms. Green, we were talking about the enhanced service provision uh, that has been implemented for veterans as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and I want to just talk a little bit about the behavioral health aspect to service delivery. Um, how would you describe the response of the veteran, the VA hospital or the VA system to increased levels and requests for mental health services? So from, from my vantage point, like I said, I don't, do not work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. However, the um, mental health aspect for veterans has been heightened over the years. And so now, because it is one of the um, it's a primary area actually when um, active duty service members are getting out now. So that is something that's taken into consideration. It is actually a, oh, I meant to bring it up here. There is a order, 
an order for mental health. I should know this by heart because it's one of my favorite areas for mental health and um, suicide prevention that has mandated that the Department of Veteran Affairs work with DOD and work with, um, I think it's Homeland Security. It might be Homeland Security. I know they're um, working interdepartmental to ensure that when transitioning service members get out, that they are aware of the services. That's one of the main things is being aware of the services as opposed to after an episode, then you want to show up with help. So now we're trying to get in front of it across the board. And you also have to keep in mind that the, the services from the Department of Veterans, they don't just happen within. There's partnership with nonprofits, for nonprofits and states, agencies, and other organizations that are involved in the big picture. Besides the fact that each state has their own department. And so everyone is not doing the same thing across the United States. You know, we're blessed in this area to have the medical center here, but that's not the case for every place. But the awareness of mental health and- You know, and it's my understanding that veterans uh, can opt to receive mental health services outside of the VA system, that they actually can use Medicaid coverage and receive services from any or agency in, in the DMV area. Is that your understanding? So I'm not 100% sure on that one. Now, it sounds like one of the partnerships that would make sense. We want to capture them in advance. But as far as I know, the community care system that the Department of Veterans Affairs has is a means for it. if the VA is not able to provide the services, then they will be able to do so. But since there is an executive order, that's what I couldn't think of, or executive order for the partnerships, then that does sound like it would be um, um, something that was that's in place because that's how serious it is. And if you allow me to back up, let me bring Please. this to perspective for a lot of people that have never served. When you're on active duty, and you're serving this country, you always have somebody telling you where to go, what to wear, how long to stay, who you're going to be around. There's always someone that's leading your day-to-day. Um, -day. And that day-to-day, -day, regardless of your rank, in general, all the way down to private, there's an agenda. So when you get out of the military, your mind gets out, your body gets out. You now have to be the prophet over your own destiny. <laughs> and if you're not equipped and confident in who you are, you're always looking for someone to give you the way, the way forward. And which has happened to so many veterans because they don't know how to tell themselves what to do. They're waiting on something and some system to tell them what to do. And now there's an over an abundance of organizations and things that are out there that say veteran, but they're not all necessarily for the veteran. A lot of them are, what can the veteran do for me? And if you don't know what you're signing up for, if you don't know how to go to the source, so it's always good to go to the source. The VA, you know, granted, we didn't know the VA when we were on active duty. We met the VA when we got out. So that's one thing that's definitely happening right now that I'm so excited about is that the VA is showing up in advance of getting out of, of, of active service. So the service member can know Uncle VA instead of getting out on active duty because it's not the same. It's two different worlds. And if you don't know, have confidence in who you are and what you're capable of, it is very easy to get out and find yourself homeless. A lot of people go back home to their parents, but you're no longer the child that left. So you're running back home to your parents saying that, you know, I have a house to stay, but no, you don't because now you're fighting and then you get put out and then you end up in a state. So get, just getting these, the balance. Whereas when we get out of, of active service, we can have a better awareness that being a veteran is totally different and you're able to adapt and overcome in that area as well. You know, here in Washington, D.C., uh, they have uh, support clinics, I guess, or agencies. I think it's called the Veterans Resource Centers. And mm -hmm. it's a place that veterans can go to get that case management support, uh, uh, identify resources that they're entitled to or available for. And it seems like to be a great uh, 
support center for many vet veterans who are transitioning back home, like you said, who aren't very aware of territory, navigate all of the, the services that are available. Ms. Green, I did my graduate training with uh, combat veterans. Um, my focus was on PTSD, and this was the late 80s. Now, of course, we've extended trauma work way beyond combat veterans. But what I recognize then and currently still am very aware of clinically is that anyone with a, who, who is predisposed uh, to any behavioral health dilemma, uh, whether it's trauma-based or not, whenever there's a stressor, it creates a potential risk relapse or exacerbation of symptoms. And I can imagine for the many veterans that I've treated over the years that this pandemic backdrop has, it's just a, a condition that's ripe for stress uh, and creating some real real disturbance for, for just, you know, how you're navigating life. Um, so I appreciate the service provisions being increased because I know on the non-military non side, the referrals for mental health services has tripled over the years. Uh, folks who have never engaged with mental health services are seeking services. And those with a history we're finding are going into crisis. Um, and so I imagine, and maybe you can speak to this, um, do you believe that veterans are seeking out more services? behavioral health services as a result of the pandemic? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Remember, we serve not one day alone. Go on to the military, you got a buddy system. You got the buddy system on the listed side and on the officer side. And to be in isolation for so long, it causes these little gremlins in your mind to talk, kind of talk to you or, you know, take you back, especially if you were in a combat zone. It takes you back to the time where, you know, you were deployed and under those circumstances, be it a deployment where there's mortars falling out the sky or a deployment where you're doing humanitarian services. But it's always these thoughts that, you know, that you can accumulate if you don't have a focus of way forward. And I think I started off saying about the elevation of fear was so great when the pandemic happened that it's easier to think about evil things that can happen in uncertainty instead of taking uncertainty as an opportunity to evolve. And we found that we were able to evolve. Yeah. But when it first started, the uncertainty for something evil was so much greater, which would make you need um, the support of mental health. And now more people have gotten comfortable with the virtual world. So now I can talk to you without getting, leaving my house. And, you know, you're my video friend and, you know, you're comforting me and I'm not alone. But then after I finish talking to you, I'm back in the same environment of loneliness until the next encounter. And so, yes, I can see it being heightened because we, you know, we're used to being in a team system and now we're forced, even when we weren't not forced before to be in isolation kind of. Uh, I appreciate that uh, analysis. I never considered the isolation factor uh, specific to the veteran perspective, right? They're not used to working alone or being alone or dependent all of the time. And so that's real. I want to take a moment to, to shift to a homelessness uh, and, and specific to the veteran population. I can't imagine what this experience is like uh, going through COVID-19 uh, and at the same time being homeless. The vulnerability that must really provoke, right? I'm on the streets, I don't have access to shelter. Uh, I may not have the resources I need to even keep myself safe, sanitizer and masks. I may not even have the, the, the access to those things. And I'm generally residing in very common uh, experiences, whether it's a shelter or even just out on the street. What are you hearing about the state of homelessness specific to the veteran population? Um, well, that could be twofold because the veteran population, uh, when you said, like you said, they used to were, even in this area, you, you talked about the centers that we have, but we still have a high number of homeless veterans in this area. And so the be living on the street, one of the things that my, our committee was pushing is that we have um, 
the patient alignment teams to go our impact alignment teams to actually go to the veteran. So now we have to make sure it's safe for those that are going out into the to streets to help the veterans, as well as making sure that they have PPE and not just a one-time thing. So how can we how can we make it where they can be safe and still have the proper equipment to remain safe, which elevated um, changes in the HUD bash voucher system. So the housing department and the VA has a program, it's kind of like section eight, where we can give vouchers for to veterans who qualify to go and find housing. So now we've enlightened um, that program to make it easier. And we've also, the, the programs that they have as far as getting permanent housing and the programs for grant per diem, which were housings that have been developed to house homeless veterans. All of these programs that are out there that many veterans know nothing about <laughs> that are you know, getting awareness has been heightened because now we wanna go out to the veterans instead of having them come to the VA because now they can't come to the VA even if they wanted to now like they used to. So pushing that information out and making it um, important to even use hotels to get them off the street. So I think across the whole country, it's an it was an intentional effort to make sure that, and then we have a, now I understand that they have uh, phones. I'm not, I don't remember exactly who, which organization has this, but I know they have phones that they have given to homeless veterans that they get to use for I think a year for a year so they can be in touch. They can be in touch with the VA, the VA can be in touch with them yes. and make sure that they have um, everything that they need. So then the intensity of making sure that veterans are taken care of has been elevated. The results of it so far, I can't tell you from my vantage point, but I'm happy to say that there is very, there has been a lot of things done to elevate, to make sure that our homeless population is moving towards zero as opposed to growing. Yeah. And that you does know, include prestige. the mental aspect as well. Yeah. You know, Prestige uh, has um, made some adjustments in terms of how we provide interventions. I'm an old school therapist, so I'm used to folks coming to the clinic. You're coming into my office. I'm sitting a couple feet away from you. I'm fully engaged with your person. And uh, so when we, uh, we, I'm talking about mental health practitioners, had to convert into a telehealth model, uh, some of us struggled with that. First of all, getting comfortable with using Zoom and, and just signing up the, the Zoom profession. And what we encountered at Prestige for sure was our consumer base had an equal and in some instances exaggerated difficulty with access to technology, which means if I can't access through Zoom and telehealth, how do I get the service? Prestige was very creative. And for those consumers who didn't have a, even a phone, we uh, supplied them phones, which I think, think is really a testament to the attitude and philosophy of the agency. And so we got some grant funding and we're able to supply many of our homeless clients with a phone so they could maintain the service, individual therapy, community support. They're able to still see their psychiatrists and, and get their prescriptions. Um, and so I can imagine for the veterans, there's a need to have access through technology, right? If I'm homeless and I'm isolated, um, how do I communicate with my treatment providers or family and friends? And so it's a critical source there. Um, you've been inside for, for quite some time as a result of the pandemic. I imagine you've been tele using telemedicine and Zoom a lot. Is that right? I just had an appointment. How, last how week. Is it <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, but how I go often to the do VA you too. get to leave the house? Okay. Well, I leave the house. How often um, do you leave? Quite home? often. Oh, I <laughs> said so we have a delay. But I leave the house um, quite often. As I said, I travel because my, at the beginning, my mom had a, a minor stroke and she was in a facility. And so we always talk about COVID impacting people directly, but indirectly, when we could not visit her, it was the worst thing ever, not being able to visit her. 
And needless to say, my mom has transitioned since then. And my dad in Texas, so I would go monthly to take him to his appointment. And luckily I was able to do that. So I did get a chance to see him. I'm like, my mom, all in Texas, I can see him, but here in Maryland, I couldn't, I couldn't really go in. But anyway, needless to say, so I, um, I go to the VA for a certain, certain appointments even now, but just being in the house, when I, if I'm not doing that, I'm here, I'm not doing anywhere. I do training. And so I, um, matter of fact, I'm getting ready <laughs> to train and setting up in the house, but I don't know. For me, it's a little different because mentally I, I, I know how to adapt. I know how to overcome and I know how to help people see this as temporary. This is not forever. This is just temporary. And this is personal, but in my opinion, I hate the fact that we had to endure COVID. I hate the negative impact that it has had on so many of us. But I love the fact that it pushed people to see beyond yesterday. <laughs> We're so busy looking yeah, backwards sure. to the way things have been that our vision for tomorrow mm -hmm. is strained. And now we know, we know that we can do things differently. Like right now, we're not in the same room, but we're still able to have a conversation. I can still see you. That doesn't mean that everything is canceled because my yesterday is still telling me what to do. So I love the fact that now we have to be creative. We had to figure out ways to make impact, doing it different than what somebody else did. So now we're doing something new. I love that aspect of it. So Yeah, I, I as well. I want to go back to something you shared, and I appreciate your transparency, uh, your uh, sharing about your family. And I'm sorry to hear of the loss of your mother. And, and you made me reflect, you touched my heart, actually. I was reflecting back to when my mother was going through her struggle, her health challenges. She's also deceased, living in Buffalo, New York. And man, trying to support a, a parent from a distance is challenging. It does in itself. I'm here and she's there. And, and, but you made me consider how would I have navigated things uh, during a pandemic? I would fly up, take medical appointments and fly back home. Sometimes I would drive up and drive back. Um, but there was a constant back and forth, constant movement between Buffalo and Washington, D.C. And I could see that that would have been very much restricted um, or it would have been very different if I had to consider those options now. Um, so I appreciated you sharing that and it allowed me to reflect back. Uh, and I was so appreciative that I could support my mom in that way. Um, and the challenge is now though, you know, you're hearing family members saying that they can't even have access to their family members who are in, you know, nursing homes or rehab centers because can imagine the, the pull that must have on them emotionally, not being able to see your mother or your father. Um, speaking of uh, rehab care and senior care for veterans, what does that look like? If, if I'm an elderly veteran and I have some nursing uh, care that's required, what services are available? There is a whole department that's um, dedicated to that. Now, I don't know firsthand how that works, but I know that there is um, assisted housing arrangements for veterans. They have uh, the geriatric unit in, that's in the hospital here. I'm, I'm not sure about across, you know, all of the VAs across the state that they have that, but I'm 100% that they do have some there's an awareness that once you get past a certain age, that there is a greater need. And there are things in place to help our, our seniors. But I'm not sure. I can't give you 100% on that one. And let's talk about coping strategies. And I'm interested to hear uh, what strategies you apply. I know for me, I take walks in the neighborhood. I was sharing in another podcast how, how familiar I am with my neighborhood now. I know who lives where and to explain time the mailman comes and I know all the secret paths in the neighborhood. And so I take a lot of walks. Uh, I've become efficient with uh, streaming my spiritual, uh, my church services. Um, 
and I, it's afforded me an opportunity to have more intimate discussion and more intimate time with my youngest son. I have one son still at home. He's 19. And so it's, it's afforded me an opportunity to really talk with him, share space with him, get in his head and me to understand him. And so uh, that's been helpful to me. What, what things have you relied on to get through the pandemic? Do you have any recommendations or suggestions around coping skills? Well, you've touched on one major one, getting out of the house, um, walking in the neighborhood, seeing the neighbors and actually talk because, you know, we're a different environment. People live next door to each other and don't even know their names. That's ridiculous. And so actually speaking <laughs> to, to your neighbors from a distance or whatever it takes with actually just having that interaction with the people that are around you. I don't know about how the neighborhood you grew up in, but I know when we had that snow in Buffalo as a child, you know, our neighbors would like clear the whole street. You know, they had the men were out there with the snow blowers and snow and blowing the snow and you knew everybody. That is no longer the case. And so, but no, the, for coping, no. yeah. Okay. So for coping, one thing is I have um, my battle buddies. So I have people that I talk to daily um, checking in on one another or what's going on. And I stay engaged like the woman veteran organization. When it first started, the president, she started doing weekly, um, we, what we call, uh, pink and white breakfast. So we would have weekly, uh, meetings and bring in different organizations to speak to the ladies about free legal or disability or, um, military sexual trauma or just helping to bring the community together to still be, so you don't feel like you're alone. And it makes such a big difference. So coping for me is just stop looking on social media to what's going on. Have a conversation, pick up the phone, Zoom with people, you know, you know, we have now they have Zoom happy hours and Zoom birthday parties and Zoom anniversaries. You don't need an excuse or a holiday to make you want to in engage with people. They're breathing, you're be breathing. Just saying, hey, I was thinking about you. It's something as simple as that. Those little small things create big things. Just, just saying hi, <laughs> smiling, getting in and get out of fear. Like just totally get out of fear. Just be obedient. Wear your mask. You know, if, if, if you choose, I'm, a, I'm an advocate, but if you choose, get the vaccine because the vaccine is bigger than you. In my opinion, it's about a community. It's about this world coming together. What does it take for us to be back in fellowship? And if that's what it is, bless it and yeah. do not curse it. <laughs> so that, that, that would be my advice. Yeah, no, very helpful. You know, I, I remember back, one of my fondest memories actually of Buffalo, New York was the blizzard of 1977. Oh, yeah. You were okay. just an infant there. I don't know if you even remember that, but I was I maybe do. 14 or 15. <laughs> so when you, when you speak about how the community supported one another, I remember for that entire week, my entire neighborhood, my entire block had to dig ourselves so we could e even get out of, out of the, not just the driveway, but get out of the main street. Mm -hmm. uh, but what a wonderful opportunity to meet and greet your neighbors and share stories and just share a common, you had a common goal. We had to get out of this neighborhood so we can get back to living. Um, yeah. So the social aspect of, of living is undeniable. So what's your favorite uh, buffalo wing? Where do, you, where, where do you get your buffalo wings from? The Anchor Bar. <laughs> Anchor Bar, okay, I got it. What's your favorite pizza okay. spot in, in, in Buffalo? Bocce's. Bocce's, that's it. Okay, we're on the same page with that. We're on the <laughs> but same Avenue, page. you know, now lately, Avenue, Avenue is the spot too now, so I, I like it. Oh, Avenue. is that right? Okay, okay, okay. Um, so you talk about being active, uh, not secluding and isolating yourself trying to have a, a pretty consistent routine. Uh, you've had the advantage of, of taking the vaccine, so it, it allows you to be a little more active, a little more mobile with, with less anxiety and, and fear. Um, what does diet play into this exercise? Do you, do you exercise much? I know you're an athlete. Do you, do you still go to the gym and work out? I still pay for my gym memberships. 
I, actually, I invested <laughs> in the mirror. So I invested in the mirror. But I'll be okay. honest, um, diet has been horrible. <laughs> has been hor- I still exercise. It has been horrible. And um, I even lately, I tried to blame it. I had to, my, I think sitting around being lethargic really did some work on my knees and my shoulder initially. So I had to get um, steroid shots. And then I, you know, found myself gaining more and more weight. So I try to blame it on that, but I don't really think it's that because I still get up and I still work out. My mirror is being used by a young person who's running out of my basement, probably more than me, <laughs> but I do have it available. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm always, I I'm always active <laughs> doing something, walking the bridge. I did that recently. I went to the Woodrow Wilson, walk the bridge. And I don't mind getting out there by myself too. So that helps. That helps a lot. Right. And a lot of these uh, activities, you're still doing it. You generally aren't doing it in groups. You're, when you go out for your walk, it's by yourself. And when you go to the gym, you have to still maintain distance. And um, you're, there's still some isolation uh, experience, even when you're outside of your home. Um, not with groups of people. Do you think we'll ever go, do you think we'll ever get back to normal? Is, you know, I hear people talk about a new normal. Um, yeah. What, how would you describe the, your new normal? I don't, well, my new moral normal is just kind of whatever, whatever you make it. Like even during the pandemic, just being at, like I said, I love to travel. So I even, I've been out to Las Vegas since the pandemic, just renting a room and just kind of, hanging out of that. And I really, I shouldn't say hang out. I don't hang out and I don't really do the slots or anything like that, but taking advantage of lower hotel rates <laughs> and airlines, just changing the environment, hiking. I've been to Mount Zion and I'm just going to be able to go and hike and be outside. So I wouldn't say um, a new, we'll ever get back. I don't think we'll ever, be, I just came back from the NCAA tournament. So putting the mask on and being around people, um, that'll be there. I think we have a desire to want to be around. Like we're afraid of people, but yet I want to be around them. So the biggest new more, new more will be a little hybrid. Like you'll have the virtual aspect for people who just don't want to get, don't, they don't want to be around, but then you have the in-person aspect of still being able to be in fellowship with people. I, I think that's a, a desire of our natural ability is just to be around and laugh and, and enjoy the company of someone else. So I don't know about, no, I just know that whatever is in front of us, my mouth is going to say, it's going to be good. <laughs> I will yeah. not say it's going to be bad. It is going to be good. It's, it's, it's stretching us as a people. And then it's allowing yeah. us to actually see to see people, to see them and want to contribute. I hate that it takes tragedy for us to come together and want to help one another. We can just want to help one another. We, we can just want to be there for them, for each other, I, I should say. I definitely appreciate your optimism and your enthusiasm and the tenacity that you, and the hope that you're extending to yourself, but also sharing with us. Um, I'm definitely going to extract from this experience all good things, right? Like you said, and and I'm used the uh, the pandemic term uh, to my advantage. Um, new awarenesses, new understandings, um, and I've also identified some new strengths that I actually possessed that I didn't even know were there. <laughs> uh, most importantly, I'm just so grateful for life and all that 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 entails, uh, and so been a moment to reflect and it's a humbling moment to realize that um you know there must be a higher power greater than us uh that can protect us and keep us safe i've enjoyed the time today um uh, definitely you know being from buffalo and i'm being from buffalo it's just a right. <laughs> rare opportunity um to greet someone from back home um as we conclude the show can you share some, a few words of encouragement? And you have done so throughout the podcast today, but is there something specific you can share with our audience to encourage them to keep moving forward, to keep progressing and to maintain hope? Um, I would just say that the same 
the same mouth that can speak evil is the same mouth that can speak good. The same mouth that can speak um, the end of the world and distress and depression is the same mouth that can speak vision and life and progression. And so I would just tell you to look ahead, like close your eyes, look around in your environment. How much of your environment is speaking about yesterday? Make room for part of it to speak about tomorrow. And then connect yourself with people that stretch you, like where you have strengths. Look for it to be around people that have strengths and your weaknesses so that you're complimenting. And my biggest, biggest um, operation of hope, and this is going to be, it's going to sound a little crazy. See beyond your family. <laughs> Open up your heart to unconditional love that it includes people that are strangers today, but they choose you tomorrow. Like they're not obligated to you. Mm. They choose you. That's the best thing that the military gives us. We come together as strangers and we walk away with such great relationships because we choose one another. And so in times of need, when people choose you is way better than those that are obligated. And I'm not taking nothing away from the family. Love my family, nothing that's away. Right. That's but there's right. a difference. Oh, that's right. There's a big difference. So that helps. That helps men mentally and physically and emotionally when you choose to enjoy life with people that choose you back. Sharon Green, this has been a wonderful time spent. Uh, Sharon Green, the leadership coach. Sharon Green, the national speaker. Sharon Green, the trainer executives and nonprofit personnel, Sharon Green, U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm sure people, uh, once they get a chance to listen and watch this podcast, might want to reach out to you and just get to know you uh, and, and, and gleam some more information from you. Is there a contact uh, is there a way for our audience to reach out to you and contact you? Sure. I mean, I haven't been on social media as often, but you can always reach me at Sharon D. Green on Facebook, or that's Green SD27, which is the handle on Facebook, or um, on LinkedIn, it's Sharon D. Green, or my company, Alethes, which is A-L-E-T-H-E-S Consulting Group. So that's A L E T H E S consulting group.com. Um, you can reach me there as well. And so, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm available. I'm that's sure. my claim to fame. <laughs> okay. All right. Good to know. Good to know. I'm sure people are going to reach out to you. This has been a, a remarkable show today. Uh, you've really gleaned some information uh, that's useful regarding the veteran population and your experience in the military. Uh, but most importantly, you've demonstrated uh, for us uh, good coping mechanisms and strategies to overcome not just the pandemic, but just life challenges overall. Uh, you know, you, you, you're speaking to your faith, uh, the foundation of uh, promote good health, uh, but there are some other strategies you shared that uh, were also helpful. Uh, listen, Prestige, if you want to know, learn more about Prestige Community Resources, you can always hit the website up at prestigecommunityresources.org. Um, and again, our guest today was Sharon Green, a native New Yorker. Uh, thank you, Ms. Green, again, for, for sharing your story. And until okay. next time, family, be safe. Be well.